This is the Time on Wing podcast. Welcome back. This is episode, I think, 14. 14, is it, Karen? 14. Episode 14. For some, you know, <laughs> number 14. <laughs> number 14. Yeah. I'm Courtney Miller with Visual Approach Analytics. With me, as always, is Garrick Deshavan of Collateral Verifications. Garrick, whose time on wing are we discussing today? So today, uh, we've got the, I don't know if you call him infamous, more than famous, I don't know. He's definitely, uh, he's definitely on, on the top of the list for a lot of folks. Larger, larger than, than life. life. He's definitely tall. He's definitely tall. And well, which, according to me, I mean, everybody's tall. But um, <clears throat> I mean, so today we actually, so we have Rod Sheridan. And uh, you're, we've both known him for a long time. You've known him longer. You've worked with him. And this is a gentleman that has actually done, uh, you know, a couple of little things here and there, um, you know, throughout his career. And uh, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun today. I mean, overall today, Rod is, is uh, you know, owner CEO of uh, Sheridan Aviation Services, where, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about what he's doing today. But, um, you know, if we kind of go back at the beginning, um, so Rod actually got his private pilot's license at 17 and then his commercial license at 18, which... Um, I believe he was actually one of the youngest commercial pilot in Canada for like 30 days or so, um, based on that, which is pretty cool. Um, and then he's had a handful of flying jobs, um, you know, while he was kind of just accumulating his hours. So he was like anywhere from like a ferry pilot, ad hoc charter, air ambulance, freight instructor, bird dog, which I don't even know what that is, but we'll find out. Uh, you probably do. It's a dog it's just, that so he, chases birds. <laughs> so he was chasing birds. All right, cool. Um, he also holds uh, air transport rating, instructor rating, including multi-engine actual IFR, aerobatic floats. He's flown like 60 gazillion airplanes. Uh, I mean, you know, he's, I don't know, I don't know what he hasn't done, to be honest with you. I mean, he actually in the mid 80s, um, he started a new Piper distribution network in the east in Eastern Canada, which is still in operation today. Uh, in '86, he went to work for Boeing Canada as used uh, aircraft sales team, uh, as the, or to create the used aircraft sales team. Um, he ran the new aircraft sales team for Latin America and then Southeast Asia and then India for Bombardier uh, when it acquired DHC. Um, he created the aircraft trading unit in uh, the mid nineties for Bombardier. He was part of the CRJ launch. I think he's bought, I don't know, I, I probably every airplane that's flown in Canada, be my guess, uh, bought and sold about every airplane out there. Um, he was part of a bunch of securitizations as well. He ran the residual value portfolio management team. Um, he was also instrumental in creating the, uh, the Russian sales and business development group, um, which placed about 100 or so CRJs into Russia, as well as some Dash 8 uh, 400s. Um, he did retire at some point in 2014, but uh, decided that, uh, you know, well, let's retire. Yeah, let's keep going. Retire. So he was then vice chair at NAC um, from 2015 to 2021. He was then chairman of NAC in 2021 through 2022 while they were restructuring. Uh, he's also spent six years as a trustee for the ISTAT Foundation. And, you know, this is kind of the cool part is he was also he's been, you know, chairman of Canada's Aviation Hall of Fame, uh, which I didn't realize there was an Aviation Hall of Fame, but that's pretty cool. Um, so he's done a few things. So, you know, I think we're um, we're in for a treat today. I think our listeners are in for a treat. Um, so, Rod, this is your time on wing. So Rod, thanks for thanks for being with us today. I'm sure you've you've listened to some of the other podcasts that we've done, but uh, obviously the idea is to kind of get to know you a little better. And you know, one of the things that I always you know kind of how to get things started is to find out ultimately, you know, how you got into aviation. What what was the the one thing or the person or whatever you did that got you uh, that gave you the bug and got you into aviation? Uh huh. Okay. What got me into aviation? I, you know what? I I grew up on a horse farm, and my parents were both riding, and uh, my mother reminds me constantly that she saw me sitting on a Western saddle one day. She says, oh, are you riding a big Bronco? I said, no, I was flying an airplane. 
And that was when oh, I was wow. probably about four or five years old. And I had an uncle who had a Cessna 140 on floats and a Cornell, which uh, you guys probably have never no, heard of a Cornell, no. but it was a, heard a trainer with a gypsy major engine in it. Uh, it was like a, it was a, a bad version. Somebody's going to shoot me for this. It was a poor version of a chipmunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, wow. And so, so anyhow, that, those were the first the, the first flying that I did, and then uh, our farm was uh, close to uh, Brampton Airport, and I had a friend who was working there, and so when I was fifteen, I started uh, pumping gas and cleaning airplanes and that sort of thing, and then it just right. went from there, and I uh, always been fascinated why, and it was the uh, my mother will tell you that it was the downside for my education because I just spent every waking moment and every, I would do anything I could to make money. Uh, to pay for things and uh, I was very lucky that my grandmother actually when she uh, she called me and she said yeah, I know you really want to do this so I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to give you some inheritance now and that actually helped me pay for a huge amount of what I did of my wow. licenses. <clears throat> that's awesome yeah wow what a patron huh yeah yeah it was very cool it was yeah. very very cool so what aircraft did you train on then uh Citabria Oh, very nice. I got my pilot's license. I first soloed on a Citabria, and uh, then uh, and that obviously flew everything else. I think I've flown every Cessna because I used to do so many trip ferrying. Even when I was like 17, I was ferrying airplanes from the factory and moving across Canada. I wasn't, wasn't a commercial pilot, but they just said, oh, well, you're not really getting paid for it. <laughs> so, you were just logging the hours, right? So that's just all about the hours. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. How does one... How do you land that gig? I mean, is this um, it, it was this from the Canadian side, or was this more working it was, with, yeah, it was, with Cessna? Uh, no, it was a, a guy who actually uh, the first guy who got me doing it was a fellow who worked uh, worked with at uh, Bombardier, who actually brought me into to Haslam when it was Boeing Canada. I was Sean Bourne, and uh, I met up with him. I moved an airplane over to he was working over at, uh, uh, at Buttonville, and uh, I took an airplane there and he said, Hey, do you want to go pick up a 172 for me in Wichita? And I said, sure. And so I went and did it. And that was, I got linked into him and a bunch of other people. And uh, that's, it was just, it yeah, started from yeah, there. Yeah, which... And I just never said no. I didn't care. I didn't care what airplane it was. I didn't care where or when. I just said, yes, I'll go do it. I'll go do it. And then uh, I think p people kind of got upset when I all of a sudden decided that, uh, well, now I should be getting paid for this. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's one thing. I mean, those are those are cross country hours when you need them. Oh yeah, it was it was interesting stuff because and the, the funny part was is that most of it was with a handheld radio. Like we were bring, I was bringing back airplanes because the the Cessna uh, distributor at that time in Canada uh, also had an avionics shop, so he liked putting the radios in up here, mm. and so they're huge. I mean, we were bringing Cessna four hundred twos up with no radios <laughs> in them. Well, yeah. That that's interesting. <laughs> so can yeah, you imagine that, Courtney? <laughs> yeah. No, I can't. <laughs> You're stressing me out, Rod. Yeah, no videos. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, which I mean, how long of a flight in a Cessna 172, right, from Wichita to I don't know where you were going to Canada, but like how long of a what is like how long does that take? Well, you're going to some most of the time you're going to Winnipeg, so it was just straight north. Oh. And that was probably going back. I don't have my logbook here, but I could tell you exactly what it was. But it was probably, it was usually a two-day trip. I think I made it once mm. in one day, but it was just, you know, it was three stops and just bang, keep going, keep going. But I had a clear shot so and it was, different. weather was going to go bad. So. Okay, here I thought you were you were heading towards Buttonville or, or Toronto, you know, across Chicago, Detroit, in the Toronto airspace. Oh, lots of that. You're going north to nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. North You're to heading nowhere. up like, into you, the bush. There are no other airplanes to hit. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So it was easy is what you're saying. It was it easy. Was, yeah. You know, but again, it was, yeah, I mean, you kind of made it up as you yeah. went along. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Jeez, somebody That's, gonna, I have a lot of friends who are with Transport Canada, so I can, and so I'm, if, saying yeah, some I'm of pretty sure you're not going to get, <laughs> you'll get retroactively fined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the aviation has changed a little bit in, in the last uh, couple of decades, so. I think it's a little bit different, but uh, yeah, yeah exactly. you know, you know what ama always amazes me is the 
for and and I have friends that obviously that are pilots now and and you know when I went to school I started off I wanted to be a pilot as well and then I was like eh, you know what it's just not it's just not for me um but all my friends and it's amazing once you once you get that bug of like wanting to fly that's all you want to do and it's amazing all my friends that were that have you know that are you know flying for major airlines now every time I talk to them they're still like I just I love it so much and I can't believe I get paid to do it right it's just right it's just that yeah. that I don't know that feeling, which I never had. And that's why I'm glad I switched. But, um, but it's amazing. Yeah. People that just have that, that bug for flying. It's just kind of like, man, it gives you a rush or I don't know what it is, but it just seems like you'll do whatever it takes to, to do it again. Yeah. I mean, my problem was like, I got out of flying professionally by the time I was like 24. And, uh, because I had done all of a sudden I was realizing that you know, sitting in the right seat of a Learjet or that sort of thing and doing those trips was actually pretty boring. And, you know, having to deal with loudmouths uh, in the back and uh, who, you know, they want to do it now. And no, what do you mean you can't go now? What do you mean this is, you know, I just, I didn't yeah. have any time for that. And I had done so many cool different, uh, so many cool things like ferrying airplanes around the world. And I had done, you know, I was, uh, I got all my different instructors ratings and that sort of thing, you know, so I was, and it was fun, really, really fun flying. And so I, all of a sudden now I look at it and I go, geez, it, yeah, I couldn't see doing that again for the rest of my life. Number one, because you didn't get paid much doing what I was doing. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I got into the business side of things. Yeah. So um, Rod is definitely a pilot's pilot. I left the cockpit in 2007. I'm afraid to get back in. In fact, I slid into the right seat of a CRJ 900 during a demo flight and I can't, uh, who was the chief uh, test pilot? Was it Jean-Guy? No, Jean-Guy Blondin that... was uh, one of our pilots. He did um, a lot of demo stuff. But I, th I think it, I know. Anyway, he, I, yeah. uh, I slid into the right seat. He kind of looks at me funny. He says, you've done this before. Like, yeah, I did. I'm a little nervous that, that you know, I'm going to relapse um, <laughs> by getting into the seat. But you've you've successfully never kicked the addiction, the kind of the, the pilot's pilot. Um, it's something that I'm that I retain jealousy over um, because I, I just I, well, first of all, you can't afford it. Yeah. Right. It's the, it's a very expensive, it's very expensive hobby way to live if you're not getting paid to do it um and and secondly it's it's insanely addictive it is and but i i also i will say now courtney and about uh, three years ago there was a husky uh, about a 10 year old uh, husky for sale here in canada and i went and looked at it and i came with and you know finishing signing my name uh, of buying it but then I, I talked to a buddy who i really respect he's a great pilot he's a glider pilot he, and i respected him and he had just let his medical lapse and he was 66 and so i was you know a little bit younger than him and uh, i said geez why did you do that gordon and he said well i started realizing that i wasn't keeping us up to date on new things and yeah flying the gliders and that was fine and that but i just I, it was time to it was time to stop and so i started thinking about it and i think all the flying i'm doing like i'm usually with somebody who can is there who knows a lot more than i do of the new regulations airspace because i admit i have not kept up i've done you know little bits of flying in that but i always have somebody who can get me out of trouble you know i i'm not worried about the hands and feet stuff but I just realized that my my knowledge base on what else was going on, and and quite frankly, glass cockpits just scare scare me. And uh, so I just walked away from it and didn't do it. But I have a friend. Like tomorrow, I'm uh, uh, flying in a friend's Turbo Beaver, and we're going from Buttonville up to North Bay to a golf tournament. Uh, and so uh, he's already said, "Yeah, because I'll give you your annual checkout." So I'll get to uh, I'll get to take off. I, I haven't taken off in it on land in probably oh five or six years. I've just been on water, so it'll be interesting because I haven't taken that's, off. Like I said, I haven't taken off on land in yeah. a while. The landing on water, taking off or Rod, landing on water. That, right? That's that crazy. last, but but that that last paragraph was the most <laughs> Canadian thing I've ever heard anybody say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take off, eh? Turbo Beaver going up to was it North Bay? 
you know, yeah. for golf, which of course, uh, and yeah, I haven't taken off or landed on, on land in a long time. Um, now, uh, so you're, you're at the cottage now. Do you, do you drive up mostly or do you, do you fly? I drive. I mean, it's a couple hours, so it's not too bad. And actually I got to drive back to the city tonight. I mean, usually he can stop and pick me up here, but I've got a couple of things I've got to do in the city. So I'm going to go back tonight. Uh, and then up and, uh, we're, uh, we're staying at a friend's place. It's right on the lake. So we can dock the airplane right there and, uh, and then drive over to the tournament yeah. and that. So, yeah. <laughs> just like that, fun. right? <laughs> just hop in the airplane That's and the just life. go. That's nice. That's nice. Um, so, yeah. so, um, how, when, you know, so you, you, obviously you said you flew through till you were about mid twenties. What, what made you shift to, Hey, you know what? Uh, I want to sell stuff. What, what was that transitioning, right? Because I mean, was it? How, how did you? Because that's that's a that's kind of a big shift, right? From like, hey, let me fly an airplane to let me just start selling it. Well, I had a huge amount of hours from the time I was the years that I did fly. But you got to remember, in those years, that was really I was flying from like, like you know, up to about eighty four, somewhere around there, and that was a really bad economic time like interest rates were if you were buying a house you were paying 19 percent interest mm. or 20 percent interest canada savings bonds were generating 19 percent 18 percent like it was just yeah. insanity i mean the, it was a really bad recession and so i was making nothing i was making no money so it was time to change things out and uh, there was a fellow who i'd done a lot of ferrying for uh, he and uh, another partner were starting the Cessna distributorship. And so they invited me to come on board. So I did. And uh, then I was still flying. Uh, and uh, I met John Leahy. They uh, dropping off a, uh, a Cheyenne that was on demo uh, down to Windsor Locks. To oh, him. Wow. That's... That was before yeah. he went to Airbus. And, uh, and uh, but yeah, I mean, I got into that and I really, really liked it. And then uh, the, the fellow that had given me my first sort of ferry thing, uh, ferry job was working for uh, Boeing Canada. He had started up a used aircraft group. He was the only guy. So he called me and said, hey, you want to come and do this? So I figured oh, I'll go do it for a couple of years. And it ended up being 25. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. And this was, I just moved on. But I kept this was doing during little the, bits of flying. But this was during that. Um, it, it wasn't a very long period, right? When Boeing owned... De Havilland was it maybe five years or so, or was it longer than that? Yeah, because I started in '86, in April '86, and they had just purchased at that point, uh, and then realized that, that the company had committed to take all these airplanes on trade, like everything from DC threes to you know, you name it. It was unbelievable, uh, and so. Uh, but they uh, sold the Bombardier, I think, in '92. Okay. Yeah, '92, I think, was when it uh, when that happened. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you yeah, show up sir. and you're, and and now you're moving the. It was the trade-in inventory, right? So this these weren't necessarily yeah. De Havilland products. No, they weren't. I mean, we had seven four eights, we had Convairs, we had uh, we had DC threes, we had twin otters. You know, it was this is before seven four eight. I'm just gonna say, I'm like, different. wait a minute, so I missed yeah. something there. <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, true, yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was, it, it was a fun time. And then I did some time, uh, in Latin America. One of the funniest things is, uh, a fellow who, uh, actually was the head of sales when they started, went, he left, uh, Boeing Canada and went to Canada Air and started the, the CRJ program. Um, he, uh, when I was doing Latin America, he said, well, you should learn Spanish. So they sent me down six weeks to, but just before I was getting married, I went six weeks and lived with a family in Costa Rica. And, uh, I came back and I got married and that sort of thing. And Tom called me in his office and says, this is going to sound like the stupidest management decision ever, but I want you to go work in the Far East. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After I had spent You're like, six muy bueno. Living, living with a family. And... Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> First time, yeah. Gracias. First time I ordered a cerveza <laughs> was in Bangkok. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, well, I, that's just that's life, right? Oh man. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, so I no, I'm I'm fascinated by 
what what do these deals look like that move in DC threes and and seven four eights and and this this type of thing? I mean, how how are those deals different than than say some of the the more recent stuff that we see still in that in that regional industry, but but from a different time and a different type of aircraft? It was again a lot of these some of these like the seven four eights were staying in uh, passenger service most of them. Uh, some into cargo. I mean, the, the, we took, there was this company called Air Ontario, uh, which was formerly Great Lakes Airlines, was a, a, a Convair 580 operator. All those airplanes went to DHL in Europe, uh, European Air Transport. And we can put cargo doors in them and move them all over there. The 748s all ended up in Africa. The Twin Otters ended up in uh, with a company uh, in who was the biggest lessor, a guy by the name of George Stevenson. And John Binder out in Calgary bought all those, and, and uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. Like it was, you know, that's where some elements of the business haven't really changed that much. Like it's it's very very. And I think a couple of your podcasts uh, talked about the relationships in the industry. Yeah, the relationships in the industry were critical back then, and I think they still exist in a lot of instances today. But yeah, but but moving them again, there were that was. That was interesting. The, the F-27s coming out of Horizon were a challenge. Um, I mean, some of the stuff I'm doing today is because we took F-50s uh, in, uh, out of uh, Lufthansa and out of, uh, I think, British European. Yeah, and we put, and that started Air Nostrum. Mm. And uh, so wow. it's, yeah, it's... It was interesting, and it gave you a really good foundation. Like all the elements of moving an airplane, like the condition and delivery condition, and you know how you get there, the ferry, all that sort of stuff, and close, where you close tax. Yeah, those things have changed a little bit, but the fundamentals of it are all still the same. You know, the financing is different; is more complex than it was back then. A lot more complex than it it was back then, but the fundamentals of the airplane of what's required in the transaction hasn't really changed that much. In my view, I, somebody's probably going to send you a note saying that he doesn't know what he's talking about. But I just... I get those all the time, Rod. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah okay. I get those by Courtney, too, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he only gets them for me. So so my first my first aircraft deal, Rod, was with John Binder. Oh, yeah. For, for, for two Dash 8s. And we closed the deal literally over the hood of his truck. We were yep. leaned in trying to figure out what was going on with the air, with the air filter and we had the paperwork and he said, great, let's get this done. We shook hands and then we went back to the air filter. It was the greatest. No other deal has been has been like that. Yeah, but that's there are a lot of people that. Um, yeah, that you can that I've known throughout the years, uh, that things have gone that way. Um, yeah, John's a good one, like John in negotiating and he gets to all the indemnities and you just, you know, John will say, is this the same that so-and-so signed? And he says, if you can put your hand on your heart and tell me that, then I'll sign it. And that was his nego- that was negotiating, a, you know, four pages of a contract. Okay, if you can tell, and uh, you know what? Other guys, another guy that did that was Bill Deleuze, who created, who was the president of uh, Air Ontario and created uh, South African Express and that sort of thing. I remember his comment in the discussion. Okay, if you can tell me that the rest of your customers sign all this stuff, we won't get the lawyers involved in that. Let's go ahead. Yeah, but but John now just Bill's to, probably going to call too and point. say, "Why did you tell me?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there was there was a, a handshake uh, between myself and and John Binder, and that handshake alone is what both sealed and saved the deal because that was his word, and his word was his bond. Yeah, and I yeah. I was I was thoroughly impressed and. I mean, it really had an impact on me just professionally going forward and in, in how I deal yeah. with it. Yeah, and oh, oh, how times have changed. Well, it, well, but you know, there there are other incidents of that where I've you know uh, where Bombardier uh, had been in trouble, and all of a sudden, hey, Rod, we got these Q four hundreds that so and so is supposed to take. We can't do this. Can you do make a deal? And I, you know, that was. Uh, I had a relationship with Martin Moeller back to into the 19, uh, 1990s and Martin, we got a problem. Can you help? Yeah. What do you want to do, Rod? And I don't know how many times Martin and I made deals over the phone that we didn't, he, he would close 
Uh, and then we would get the, all the paperwork and that would follow, like the proper paperwork for closing was there, but it was uh, our word uh, and our handshake and we closed it. Binder was the same thing. I don't know how many different things that uh, John and I did, and, you know, and Twin Otters and you name it. Uh, he was uh, very honest. I trusted him. And uh, we would, yeah, close things yeah. on a handshake. But do you think that, like, a lot of people right now. I, I know, yeah, do that that's with. the thing. Do you think that was a generational thing? All right, he I mean, looking yeah, at you, I mean, Garrett. you can't trust me, but no, uh, no but is it because like I don't know if you know, kind of the younger generation. I'm not, and I'm not saying you know, I, I don't know which generation, but like I think today's generations. I don't know if you get that. I don't, I don't get that sense of like you know, look, if you if we shake on it, it's good. I don't know if that's that's that was lost somewhere. But there has to be some history. There has to be some background to be able to get that yeah, level of trust. Of course. And you don't get you don't get it by saying hi, how are you? No. I mean no. you you know, you you have to develop it over time. And so it was funny because there was a, a, a friend that uh, Courtney knows that we uh, used to work with, Warren, when he came to work with me in sales. He'd never been in sales before. And uh, so we're doing things. Uh, Bombardier had this uh, performance management program, and you had to put these metrics in. And so he says, well, how do you know if I'm doing things? I said, well, really simple. I said, the day John Binder calls you before he picks up the phone and calls me, I'll know you're doing your job. And so the Warren day Hoppe that happened. Is a name I've, that guy is yeah. a legend. He is an absolute yeah. legend and not a whole. So, Rod, people know you. Like, you're... I, you're just come on. You're Rod. You're Rod Sheridan, right? Um, not a lot of people know Warren, but the people who do will say the exact same things. He's one of the greatest guys in the industry. He's one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. Um, I oh, learned completely. a lot from Warren. But here, here was a guy who'd been in in uh, strategy. He was, you know, doing the strategic plan for all for Bombardier Aerospace and that sort of thing. And he came to me one day and he said. Hey, you know, you guys have the third biggest risk uh, in Bombardier, but every year it gets less and every year everybody's comfortable with it. He said, can I come work for you? And he did. And that was, and he's still doing that job today. Uh, yeah, that, he that is. was amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's a few other people that are like that. I mean, that uh, I worked with and that was the coolest thing about the business. And, you know, the people that Bombardier, we used to say back years ago that the uh, British aerospace sort of uh, uh, populated the industry and everybody that you saw out there came from British aerospace and that. Now it's Bombardier. And so, uh, yeah, there's lots of good friends. We, you know, uh, we've uh, talked about a few Warren's one. Uh, Ellie was another one. To shout, she's in a commercial at uh, Azora now. Um, and, uh, They've done a good, these were all people that worked with me and we still all get together. Like there's a lunch every Christmas where probably about 10 or 12 of us, you know, all meet up someplace at a pub in Toronto and have lunch. So yeah. um, it was an amazing team. Absolutely. And it was so much fun. I enjoyed it. It's the best it. group I've, but those I've people with, sure. all developed long-term relationships with people mm -hmm. and they had trust. And, you know, it was, you know, it was just, it was just the only way to do business. And I, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say. It was a lot of fun. I think, Garrick, I think one of the other things that's different now than, than you know, even 10, 20 years ago is um, it, can a person deliver? Um, you know, where you had single person shops mm -hmm. back in the day, there are far fewer of those now. Mm -hmm but they have to go to a board. So you just can't make the commitments like they were able to before. And the legal department says, no, if the legal department says, no, the structure isn't as common today where the guy can override or the, the, the lady can override based on, yeah. based on their handshake. And so you just, you just, you make fewer commitments because there's just more, it's, it's what a maturing mm -hmm. industry goes through, I would guess. But it is a certain level of trust that you have to have been there for a while. I mean, I got away with, you know, making sort of handshake deals when we had to, because not only did I have the trust of the person on the other side, like say it was Martin Moeller or someone, but I uh, I had the trust of uh, the senior management at Bombardier, you know, and it was because they said, okay, well, if Rod said we should do that, we should, we should get right. it done because he's now 
got us that money in for our quarter end. So let's make sure we follow through guys. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. So, and that's, yeah. I mean, and, and I'm sure there, there is, it's still present today, right? It's just in, in different ways. I mean, obviously the, <clears throat> the way the industry's kind of evolved, oh, right? Yeah. It's, you do it in different ways, but it's still that, um, that level of, of, you know, trust on based on relationships is definitely something that I don't see going away at the end of the day. Right. Cause it's kind of one of those that you, once you build that, uh, then you, yeah, you feel comfortable and just picking up the phone and calling somebody and be like, Hey, look, you know, what do you think about yep. this? Or can you help me out with that? And having that relationship, the other person's not going to hesitate you know, they're not gonna be like, Oh, bothering me again. It's more like, yeah, what can I do? Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's what keeps, I think the industry going. And that's why I think it's it's great to, you know, when we talk to various folks that have kind of gone through various careers, you know, in the industry and, and uh, getting that sense of like, oh, yeah, you know what, here is kind of how, how things developed. And then you hear the crazy stories about, oh, yeah, you know what, remember that one time where we did this deal, uh, you know, on, on this basis? And you're like, okay, yeah, I, I, that's that's interesting. Um, but uh, now now if we if we think about, you know, kind of the... I guess over the course of, of your career, right? Um, you know, and, and obviously you've, you've been you're very much focused on like the regional space and, but what, I guess, what have been some of the, the biggest challenges for you in terms of kind of having gone through that? Like as, as things have changed, um, you know, and there's definitely been quite a few changes, I think, in the industry o over the course of the last, you know, 20 plus years. But, um, you know, what, what were you, some of your challenges kind of going through it? I think the... You know, when Bombardier, uh, with the, when de Havilland was purchased from Boeing to Bombardier, there were a couple of different things that were a challenge. Um, and uh, uh, the biggest one was the launch of the CRJ program and, and how successful. And there's been, I've had a lot of conversations with people about, okay, when you look at how many that was a whole, there was a whole industry that was there, you know, with some, with, uh, you know, F-27, F-28s and, you know, maybe some F-100s, but, and, uh, and, uh, British aerospace stuff, but it wasn't really, it hadn't really taken off. So there was the, there was an airplane, you know, the, the CRJ, uh, being a converted challenger, you know, everybody looked at it and said, geez, this isn't really going to work. But it was the cool thing was the entrepreneurs that really made it work. Entrepreneurs number one. So you look at like the Dave Muller and Siebenberg, and you look at the you know the guys at Sky West. Um, you look at Larry Risley. Uh, you know you you look at those people who saw this. But the the other cool thing was that we had some uh, on the Canada Air side of things. They had created a marketing group that was analyzing all the data and and telling people, hey, by the way, here's a route that you can fly within the Delta system that Delta isn't doing now. Mm -hmm. And this is what you can do. And this is how you can take it. It was it was really interesting like going through that and seeing that whole thing build up. That was pretty amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and uh, So, Rod, a, a, quick, a quick story on that. Um, was working with, uh, you, know, you know, Matt, Matt Scaffold, who's one of the greatest guys yep. I've worked with, just yep. sharp as a tack. We were sent to clean out the old uh, the old files, right? These have yeah. been around for for decades. Just get rid of the old paperwork. Here we were, the hot shots of of marketing, doing all this yeah. great analysis. We start flipping through these transparencies, and we're like, they've been doing this for decades with far yeah. less technology. This is like before Excel, and it was just yeah. the most deflating thing to look and be like, they were better than we are now. I mean, the stuff that they did in the 90s, just it, it, it I mean, it's out of necessity, right? I mean, you, you had know, to create a market. We think you should buy this airplane. And they say, why? And well, here's why. Well, and here's why. Exactly. Yeah, it was very cool. I mean, there were a couple of guys back then. I mean, Warren was part of the team. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was another fellow, Steve Horner, who was, worked there, who uh, just the stuff that uh, produced. Um, you know, you'd walk in and they'd look at it and say, wow, this justifies what a 50 seat airplane can do anywhere. But I can remember sitting in a meeting at uh, Com Air and uh, Dave Muller was sitting on a counter behind and uh, there was a presentation going on. I think Warren was giving the presentation and he showed this route and he got up and he looked and he starts questioning it. And he said, you know what? He says, 
that's probably the coolest thing I have seen yet. And he looked over at his uh, partner, Siebenberg, and said, we should do that. And uh, the guy who was head of marketing there, Randy, let's get that done now. <laughs> and it was, and they had, you look at what they did. I mean, they were, they were flying Toronto to Cincinnati, maybe three times a day in a sob. At the, if you give it two, three years after that, that flight was nine times a day in a CRJ. They had turned Cincinnati into a huge hub. And the bizarre thing was, which we found out at Bombardier, because we had to go to Wichita a lot and that sort of thing. You could go to Wichita on a Delta ticket and never get on a Delta airplane. You were on Calm Air the whole way. They had their own terminal and you would connect right through. Like, it took the majors uh, a while to figure out what these guys were able to do. But the, the, the markets that they created were unbelievable. And it was all because that airplane was available. Not so that was, you know, maybe it wasn't the greatest airplane for that, but it sure worked. I mean, I mean, nobody likes riding on a small airplane, but I mean, geez, it did an incredible job of building a whole yeah. marketplace. It, it's look, yeah, time changes perspectives, right? I mean, yeah. back back then it was a business jet, right? When the CRJ first came out, like, whoa, I get to fly on a business jet because if it's not that, it's it's a three abreast it's or four abreast turboprop. Yeah. Right. So it was, yeah. it was kind of that, that next level. But since now, of course, you know, my history included Com Air for a long time, even before I started flying there. Uh, Chuck Evans, of course, who, who had yeah. worked uh, at, at worked Com Air as well. well. Um, but the, what, what the regional jet did and why Cincinnati became such a hub for it was because it wasn't Chicago. Yeah. Because O'Hare was such an absolute mess that the ability yeah. to bypass it on all jet service was worth a lot of money, a lot of money. And those yields went through the roof. And then suddenly, oh, unbelievable. you know, it wasn't on a turboprop. And then suddenly everybody else got jets and that, that advantage kind of goes away. But Cincinnati itself was kind of, it's it's not like that anymore. That's, that's for no. sure. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing, but you had a lot of like really interesting entrepreneurs that um, that were able to pull things together, and they took advantage of it in a big way. And then you also had, but the, but the other thing too is that if you look at how the airplanes were financed, you were they were buying like you know nineteen million dollar airplanes and paying you know ninety a hundred thousand a month for them because of you know leverage leases, mm -hmm. tax leverage leases that were out there and. And that sort of thing. So they were just, yeah, they were able to uh, huge contribution to the bottom line. It was it was an interesting time all around. The interest rates were higher. Interest rates back then were probably like five six percent where they are today. Uh, but, but but with the leverage leases that were out there, and the leverage leases for Bombardier took a big gamble in uh, putting uh, residual value guarantees there, which was part of my job uh, was managing that whole process. And it was uh, it was interesting because we, you know, we had a strategy and uh, the I think well, it was last year, uh, I think all the residual value guarantees were gone and it was no longer aligned in Bombardier's financials. What? It was pretty cool. And, but it wouldn't have happened without that. Would not have yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So, so that's an interesting from a from a from an appraiser standpoint, right? Th that's an interesting thought of, OK, so you're when, when did the that program start? Uh, of the the RVGs, what was it? RVGs probably started in like ninety five, okay. ninety six. So you're you're going into a product where you're supposed to figure out what you think the airplane might be worth after what twelve years, ten years, twelve years uh, on an airplane that hasn't no oh, 16, sixteen years, sixteen, uh, in it on an airplane that. Is still young enough where there isn't an airplane that is 16 years old, right? So from your standpoint, how do you how do you put a number Correct. there? I mean, I, that that's the challenge that you know certainly as as a, as an appraiser when you look at new airplanes, you're like, all right, what what is that compared to, or what, how do you figure that out? And then you kind of guesstimate, but like you're then all of a sudden telling a policy to that to kind of go, oh yeah, after 16 years, we think it's going to be worth eh, you know this number, like. <laughs> I mean, I would love to hear like how did how did that come about? Because I mean, that's a long time, right? And that's assuming that the airplane's going to fly for 16 years, which when you're just starting out, 
like I remember when I when I first started to, you know, praise CRJs, I think the 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 idea was like, oh, these are gonna have, you know, economic useful life of like maybe seventeen years, eighteen years based on like what they were flying. And I mean and, and it's been thirty okay. years, right? And they're still flying. There's still a good amount that are out there. So, you know, it's kinda like we had no idea, right? But now all of a sudden you're putting a policy in place based on that. So I, I don't know. I'd love to hear you that, how that came about. Well, it was, <laughs> I don't want to say, one. yeah, I, I, I don't think it was, uh, or it can be said it was on a wing and a prayer, but if you looked at it, you know, we did spend a huge amount of time with uh, appraisers and we got uh, so many different opinions from appraisers of what it should be. You know, then uh, we had some very, very smart guys, uh, uh, that were able to model it out and say, okay, let's say there's, those, those were appraisers bankruptcies. Let's say, <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no, stuff okay. in Bombay. Right, I was, I was uh, but, they, but but again, from <laughs> I know I was I was not taking that bait. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm wearing an iStat Foundation <laughs> shirt. I'm sta I'm standing behind iStat. So, but yeah, we just we modeled uh, modeled the hell out of it and just said, okay, it should work and that, and then. The other thing that we did is we made sure that uh, to call the residual value guarantee, there were a whole bunch of items that were in there, like you had to meet certain return conditions. And we were very consistent at what the return conditions could be. In a lot of them, what we did is we put in a, a clause that says, if you call the residual value guarantee, then number one, we got the first right to buy the airplane mm -hmm. before you sell it. But the other thing is, if you sold it for more than what the residual value guarantee is, we got a huge percentage of the upside. So that took a lot of people out of the case. Well, we don't want to give away anything. You know, the the values dropped down. Like, you're at 16 years, you were down to like 20%, mm -hmm. yeah. something like that. So, I mean, if you look at it, that's engines. Right. That's what the engine value and some of the parts are. So it wasn't really a huge risk. The more the risk was, it's 16 years with one carrier. That was the risk. Yeah. Like, is it going to happen? What's going to evolve? Because, you know, I mean, how much of the airlines, have the networks changed in that period of time? You know, their whole, uh, you know, their whole uh, philosophy. Like, first of all, they bought out all the regionals because they were making too much money. And then they dismantled them, mm -hmm. you know. So, and then they're stuck with all these airplanes with these leverage leases that go out forever. And, you know, anytime they could try and d ditch them, they did. Yeah. You know, we went through to, a lot of different bankruptcies that we had to manage our way through these things. To give you an idea, Garrick, you know, Rod is a, a man of his word. And, and to give you an idea uh, just how much so, I, I distinctly remember a presentation where Rod uh, showed a chart of uh, residual value exposure, RVG exposure, uh, moving forward over time. And it peaked. And he pointed right before the peak, and he says, "You know what? What you know what happens here? You know what's important right here?" He says, "This is when I retire." <laughs> sure enough, like to the day. <laughs> so the the funniest part about to follow up on that story, Courtney, I made my annual residual presentation to the board of directors of Bombardier four days before I left. Oh wow! <laughs> nice. It's like so. And the, the worst part, what the worst part was, is there were a bunch of people in the room there that didn't, including Laurent Baudouin, that didn't know I was leaving. Oh wow! Oh, so wow. I walked out. So I walked out of uh, head office that day with an eighteen month consulting agreement. But that so so you mentioned something um, I hadn't really thought about, um, which I think is kind of interesting given the interest rates that we're seeing today, but. You know that U.S. leverage lease that really created this this market, um, kind of through the late '90s, early 2000s. Um, how how is how did that fundamentally just kind of not work anymore? And and does this mean that in kind of a new inflationary, higher interest rate environment, these type of structures may be considered mm -hmm. again? Or what are your thoughts on that? It was a tax lease. So you would get a insurance company or somebody who was making a lot of money and that, and they would buy the airplane and they would, uh, the depreciate. So it was great if you could close as many airplanes as possible in December. Uh, and you, and I, cause I'll get the technical data wrong here. So please, you know, I'm just sort of trying to remember, but it was about 
seven years to seven years to depreciate the airplane. That was the crossover point between the values and the depreciation. Uh, and then you were in the money from there on in. Uh, but you took huge amount of, uh, you wrote off the airplane very, very quickly. So for the, t the, uh, the present value tax benefits on those types of mm -hmm. things were like in the millions. Yeah. And so everybody, it, there, anybody who was m making money, not, they wanted them badly. And so there was always a bit of a lineup, like uh, Babcock and Brown was the number one uh, at putting things out. Uh, and there were, but there were quite a few more that were were putting out those types of leases. And uh, but the the problem was is that they when things went bad, those got really ugly because the you know the day that you started the lease because of the depreciation that somebody took, the stip loss value went to like. 10% more than the airplane was worth brand new. So there were all sorts of little yeah. hurdles like that. Yeah, that's why the seven year point was really critical because it got you into the safety zone. But before that, it was over, they were, the, the, stip, the, the stipulated loss value of the airplane was uh, well above what the airplane could be. So, so it was a uh, bit of a oh, challenge. Wait a minute. This, this doesn't, Okay, so they wanted so the the structure was such that they could depreciate the aircraft quickly. And what you're saying is, the aircraft depreciated too quickly. <laughs> like, hey, you can write the whole thing off. Well, how great is that? Like, well, that's no, but that's what a tax. That's what most tax benefits are. It's right, accelerated depreciation. Yeah. So I mean, and that's it, what it, you had us. We we that was the risk point. You talked about where risks were in that. That was the biggest risk. Is that there was that piece in there where uh, it was overvalued. The airplane was overvalued. And Garrick, uh, just thinking today, like the uh, I think yeah. the Joel Deputy's operating lease is very very similar. similar. To this, yeah, yeah. Like? Basically, you're you're very yeah. very similar. Just uh, you know, much much. It's on yeah. on a bigger scale. And and yeah. in and in uh, Germany, there mm -hmm. were the uh, the tax leases in Germany. There were a yeah. huge amount of them uh, that uh, lots of companies uh, had put out. So it's not an unknown thing, but it does create problems. It, it limits flexibility if you want it, if you want, you couldn't have something for, you couldn't make a deal on one of those for five years. If you did, then somebody else, somebody has to take the risk of placing the aircraft and continuing yeah. to pay. But then you had also jurisdictional issues too. Um, but yeah, I can remember some of the, uh, the one carrier uh, we worked with um, that had uh, Japanese operating leases uh, that uh, the, some of the owners would want to come and see the airplane once a year. When I had to clean up one airplane. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, uh, it, they were they were an interesting interesting vehicle, but it it does not allow flexibility. Yeah, I mean, it all. serves one purpose, right? I mean, it, ultimately, if you're trying to offset gains, that's what exactly. it does. But you can't expect it to all of a sudden be like, oh, you know what? Three years in, I changed my mind, or I want to do something else, and then, you know, I don't, or I yeah, don't have exactly. Gains. For, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and on the Jelco but side, he, you have to make sure that. But you don't need it now. Look at where lease rates are on narrow bodies. I mean, they're, yeah. they're in that in that yeah. range. You know, they're in the point yeah. fives and point sixes. You know, which is what the leverage leases with sixteen year commitments used to be. You know, now you can get things a lot. You know, just cheaper money out there. Yeah, hundred thousand dollars on a nineteen million dollar airplane. Right. Point yeah. five. Yeah, that's pretty exactly. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which exactly. so. I mean, when, when I when I think about the like the CRJs or even the ERJs, which I, I don't mean to offend anybody by th you know, throwing that out there, <clears throat> um, but they were they were really kind of market developers, right? Market creators um, in terms of what they did. Absolutely. Do you do you find anything like that today? Do you think there's another airplane like that today that that has the same potential, right? Because I mean, obviously the the CRJs ERJs are very US centric at the time, but is that are we seeing that anywhere else with any other airplane today? No, not really. Not outside of the main network uh, requirements, like the narrow bodies. They've got out their home within side networks and low-cost carriers and that sort of thing. You don't really see a, a demand. I, I really don't believe there's a demand for that uh, type of flying in the yeah. networks today. You know, I think it will it will come back, but that's you know, like right now they can fill every airplane they want, so the bigger the better. There will be a time where you know they're going to have to you know open their catch or expand their catchment areas a little bit like they did before, uh, but that doesn't exist today. And if you um, consider, and the other thing is, go, go ahead, Corey. 
Well, I was just gonna say, if you consider the 50 seat jet as a largely U.S. phenomenon, which it was, yes, you could completely. probably trace that back to deregulation and just the absolutely just the cycle from that. And we're on the back end of that cycle right now, um, yep. where yep. probably the rest of the world uh, is as well, um, where it's it's consolidation and it's dropping frequencies mm. rapidly, yep. uh, dropping cities yep. rapidly. So, but so one thing that I'll throw out there is that I think the opportunity, though, is starting to exist for more airlines, sort of a la breeze, uh, that are flying outside of the networks, that are not sort of dipping their toe into catchment areas of most uh, uh, of most of the network carriers, and there is going to be sort of if you go back in time to like the Hensons. The, you know, Pennsylvania is a, you look at, uh, you know, airlines in Europe, like the Jersey Europeans and that sort of thing. There is going to be an opportunity for true regional airplanes, true regional flying. It'll be smaller carriers that will start up. I mean, you know, I mean, today, if you look at where you can't fly to, where you have to go through a hub or, or there is limited, there's even limited uh, coverage, though there will be things that develop there. And that's where things like, okay, a CRJ, they're getting kind of long in the tooth and, you know, the you, it's a bit of a risk uh, saying how much it's going to cost you to run it because there's, you know, parts, yeah, there's lots of parts available now as part outs, there's lots of engines in green time, but as soon as you have to start overhauling engines, the, pro, the cost of operating is going to go through the roof. So there has to be some other vehicle that will take it. I think what Breeze did, uh, you know, Neilman did on the, on starting up, um, you know, he's, set it up based on uh, low utilization on the Ember Airs. But obviously, the 220s is not going to be able to do that. But on the Ember Airs, his utilization is, you know, half of what it could be. But that's because but the often, airplanes were available yeah. and it was inexpensive. And that sounds a lot like CRJ 200s in, say, the past 15 yeah. years, right? I mean, the number of operations that were set up very successfully. I've I've taken some heat, rightly so. Um, but I, I've taken uh, some flack for what I think is just an amazing asset in the 190 right now from an airline I perspective. Agree. It's so yeah. cheap. There's so much utilization in that aircraft. Um, yeah. And what, what Breeze has kind of proven, uh, you know, they tried to play both sides of the field with the 220 order as well and growing as crazy as they did. But on the 190 side, the, the things you can do with that airplane uh, – for the price, especially for yeah. the price, is impressive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Hundred percent. The downside. The downside is, is that the engine. Again, you have a, an issue yeah. where the the engine is going to is the Achilles heel. There, they are going to drive the costs up. Yeah, the, uh, renting the airframe, uh, you know, leasing the aircraft is is relatively inexpensive. But if you want to rent an engine or you have to pay for an overhaul, God, you're changing the value of the airplane dramatically. Yeah. You're doubling it. Mm -hmm. Which, again, is the challenge with the CRJ200 as well, right? Yeah. So here's one, Courtney. I want to see Courtney's reaction. So, Eric, this should uh -oh. be interesting. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what I have always thought is the logical replacement uh, for a, the CRJ and the 145 uh, is something like a uh, uh, a Dash Eight Four Hundred operating yeah, costs are the same. Years. Operating costs are the same, but you got you can put multiple classes in. You got virtually the same speed. Uh, you've got more opportunities for where it can go. I still think that's sort of something that will have huge benefit. Somebody's going to wake up to that in the future. I mean, it's not going to. I don't think it'll happen in the U.S. Because the U.S. there's still a, a right. huge negative uh, uh, opinion of the aircraft, but I do think that it's got that ability. It, it, yeah, look, we tried to we, we tried to do that for years. I think the I think the challenge, you know, the market was in the U.S., um, but the challenge is the market changed faster than there was adoption for that yes. idea, right? So you yep. had consolidation. Which, by the way, just turned two fifty seaters into one seventy six seat dual class, right? Yeah. And it did that across the board. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. Now, I remember 
you know, really kind of around 2010 and, and onward, you know, there was a lot of talk about the the renaissance of the turboprop, you know, shifts back into turboprops, mm-hmm. um, you know, ATR benefit from that as well, um, or greatly, even 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 more so. More um, so. But now we just have different factors, you know, the lack of pilots. Uh, it, yes. It's, it's tough. Um, but that is, I mean, look, we're talking about, what was funny, I remember the GTF came out. Of course, we were all excited about the GTF. And look, you put a gear on this yeah. and that and everything. And he says, you know how you can make it even more efficient? Take off the ducting, right? Take, take off the, the shroud. <laughs> yeah. Make it a yeah. turboprop. Yeah. Like these have been around right. for decades. And it's, so it's, it's inherently <laughs> the most efficient way that yeah. we have today to, to move people. Yeah, no, it's true. And I mean, I, I, yeah. I do think that there is... Uh, there is, there will be an opportunity at some point for for that, you know, new generation airplane that fits in that, maybe not fifty seats, but in that range. And I and I you know I know Embraer tried to do that with their, you know, fancy new turboprop, and but I you know I think they they probably didn't their timing was not not great, and I think their price expectations was not great either. But um, but from from the you know there there will be a need for that. I think it's um, it's not for every region. I mean you know I think a lot of the um, when you think about a lot of the growing markets, like what what China was, what India is today, I, I feel like those markets are just way too big for smaller airplanes, right? And I think that's why there's never been a huge regional, yes. you know, aspect to to or demand from there because it's any market that they create is already too big for for an airplane like that, right? Um, yeah. And so you, to me, I think you kind of run yeah, out of potential markets pretty quickly in terms of where else. You're going to go. the The U.S. is a mature market. I think China's obviously mature too. Europe is a mature market. So where I think that's why nobody's kind of stepped up and said, "Hey, you know, let's come out with this great new airplane." And the whole and the market went, "Yeah, absolutely, you want that." Um, but you figure at some point, right? So here, here's a trivia. Here's a trivia question for for you, Garrick, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer. But if I'm wrong, uh, well, it's the internet. It, it's the best way to find the answer is to stay say the wrong answer, and somebody will correct you. Where do you think the largest turboprop market in the world is? Oh, that's yeah, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I would have said Europe, but I'm probably wrong. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Rod knows because yeah. he's sitting in. No, it. well, which okay, yeah, yeah, which that that would make sense. I Canada. guess it, you know it Canada. depends. Canada. Yeah, because in my head, I'm thinking like larger stuff, but it's probably and it's, and it's it's not it's not even really close. I mean, the Canada just dominates yeah. uh the the turboprop market uh right now which you would think would be a bit strange considering you know how close to the u.s both geographically and culturally but um the the canadian turboprop market is is absolutely massive but then you have um i mean look at all the island uh nations right so in the south pacific yeah. um there are there are atrs that are technically etops i guess that are just Setting out, yeah. no, just kind of heading for the horizon until they see a cloud, and there's usually an island under it, and they land. Um, <laughs> and and that's the only service that a lot of these, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. There's, there's an island. Hopefully, under it. no, right? I mean, a lot of it's a hurricane. But but there's a huge market of these are uh, these are communities that are not served any other way. Indonesia mm-hmm. comes yeah. to mind as well, right? Um, but those are regional Caribbean. carriers. But those are regional right. carriers that don't exist in the U.S. anymore. They're, oh, sorry, there are some, but they're 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 very few, like the Cape Airs of the world and and that sort of thing. You know, it's you know they do exist, but they're very very small, and that's where I really believe that you'll see growth in that at some point in the U.S. But you still have this idea that the 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 U.S. majors, you know, made everybody hate turboprops. You know, they just. You know, oh, turbo props are bad. Although, was it was it the majors, or was it really the, the world doesn't was it really think that. Bombardier? Was it really you guys? Because you were like, "Hey, look, we got this brand new jet. It's like flying a business business jet, wasn't right?" It, wasn't us because we had two. <laughs> wasn't us because we had both. We got both sides of the coin. No, I my, the reason I think that you one of the sorry one of the reasons uh, there's always been some accidents that caused some uh, mm-hmm. some issues, but. the um, you know, if you looked at some of the bigger airports, if you took two turboprops out of a system, you took two turboprop slots out, in a lot of cases, they would give you three jet slots. Hmm. So there was a way of growing 
yeah. uh, what you could do because the turboprops were slower. You know, there were things uh, that uh, De Havilland did years ago of creating uh, stub runways at uh, places like Washington National and LaGuardia and that sort of thing. But all that sort of went away. As a, you know, again, air traffic control, which is a, uh, it needs to, it needs some help. There's no question to, to allow yeah, for a, like for a variety happen. of, yeah. of yeah. reasons. Um, Absolutely. But, but so what's, what's interesting, if you look at the overall just, just aircraft development um, over the years, I, I'm thinking kind of from a macro view, you had this very early push to go faster, 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 yes. faster. Right, and and that peaked very early. Uh, come to think mm-hmm. of it, probably in the seventies, maybe maybe even the eighties. And since then, it's been slower, slower, slower. Even though on the regional side we've had the switch to the jets, speed has a lot to do with yeah. that. But I say that in the context of this is terrible. What's GE's new um, the unducted fan? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. um, I'm oh, yeah. blanking here. Right, but yeah. but that's kind of you know the efficiency over right the death of the Concorde, the um, mm-hmm. you know the what was it the the Boeing's SST all those SST talk the Super Cruiser that you know it, rumor has it during each of the each of the working group sessions when Boeing was saying look how fast this airplane can go and all the airlines said how slow can you make it right because yeah. because of the economics and we're 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 kind of coalescing around this this point of economics, you know, fuel burn carbon. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we, we see these, we, we see these development techniques or development paths kind of reconverging in, in slower jets and kind of faster turboprops. Yeah, no, it's, and I mean, look, you would, yeah. you would think I mean, in the current I mean, environment, right. With, uh, you know, the green movement and everything else, you would think, now's the time for turboprops, props right because it's but you know there is and it it's obviously a very i think u.s centric view of turboprops, props right and it's it is a pretty big market but um but yeah now should be the time for where turboprops props to shine right because you can show it's it's a much greener airplane than a lot of other stuff that's out there so why not use it why not utilize that yeah absolutely so that's a question i have for you guys is that with the uh you know, hydrogen and that sort of thing. I, my view is that that's where in the regional side of that's where you'll see hydrogen uh, or some type of fuel like that. That's where it will make its first inroads uh, because it's, you know, hydrogen still has the issue. And, I, you know, I'm probably not completely up to speed on this, but I, that, you know, they have an issue that they just can't dump all the water and create the contrails that are that uh, a hydrogen uh, fuel cell would create. So the, a lot of times they they're going to have to land with the with the wastewater on board, so they're not going to get lighter. So therefore, bigger airplanes, bigger the airplane, the more it has to get lighter to be able to uh, to get its range on a smaller aircraft, a regional aircraft, a turboprop. You don't have as big a gap, so yeah, you're going to lose probably twenty percent of your range, uh, but you still it still makes it viable. So it is that's viable, kind of my thought right? is you'll, it'll end up there. <laughs> Yeah, and it's well. I I think it's important to point out too that you know hydrogen does not mean the same thing across different aircraft no. types, right? So I think what Universal Hydrogen is working on is you know uh, gaseous hydrogen yeah. that that has the volume issues, but is not that big of a problem when you're dealing with the the ranges um, where you just mm-hmm. compress hydrogen into a tank and then you use it when you need it, which is very different from. Uh, Airbus and they're looking at the the liquid hydrogen, which means you got to cool it down. Which means, you know, all the systems that we build airplanes around to warm things up before it goes to where it needs to go. Now you got to, you know, it, cool it has to be, it has to be cool. So I mean, just a completely, it's still hydrogen, but just a completely different system with different uh, challenges. And I think people, I, I would say, incorrectly kind of apply the challenges from one to the other. They're they're completely different. Yeah. But whether it be, you're absolutely right on the regional. And look, if this is going to happen, it's going to have to start on the regional side, um, mm-hmm. because this is where, look, we have payload limitations with any yeah. of these new technologies. That's not because the technologies are bad. That's just how good we got at using jet mm-hmm. fuel, frankly. Um, but those payload limitations are less impacted on the smaller side, 
right? We have just just the size and the ability to invest in these new aircraft programs. You know, electric, uh, hybrid electric, um, you know, hybrid electric jet hydrogen. You know, who knows all all the different all the different combinations. It, it's gonna. It's already started, right? On the on the regional side, I, I would I would then segment that separately from the EV toll space, which I think is is a is a different space entirely, right? I, I know they're they're talking a lot about um, about regional aviation, but that's that's very different, right? You're not going to take people out of carbon burning airplanes or trying to pull them out of electric cars. I would I would argue. Right. Um, we're, we're talking about the forward motion, you know, take off from a runway. Uh, focus on economical next generation is going to have to start at, at the regional space. It, the, the, mm -hmm. the orders of magnitude kind of require it, doesn't it? I think so. And it's, it's a way that you can at least do something for the regional space with the current engine technology, because you're going to have a, uh, you know, you can use it uh, to fly the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen fuel cells and that sort of thing where you or sorry, you're going to change to the electric and the hydrogen, but in staff, you're going to be able to use the, the motors. Um, I do think that there's going to, I don't think there's going to be anybody that is going to create a new engine for uh, regional for quite some time because they just don't see the market is there. So that has, the, the investments have to be in that sort of area. Yeah. And that was going to be my, actually my, my next question would be, how, how do you see, the regional market kind of developing over the, the course of the next 10 years or so in terms of the, the current players, right? Because it seems like they'll, you know, the players in that space just are getting smaller and smaller, right? I mean, ultimately, you've got the, uh, you know, Airbus with the A220, but those obviously much, you know, larger gauge. Uh, you've got, you know, Embraer yeah. with the E2s, but the interest level is still on the larger gauge as well. You're not really got nothing on the bottom. Uh, you know, and so you've got ATR with the turbo props, uh, and then you've got you know De Havilland that will, I think, at some point re restart production on the the Q400s, but um, but it's still very limited, right? And so you know, does that open it up, you know, for an opportunity for somebody else to come in, or is it just, as you say, just too much of a small market to make a business case that makes sense? And so are we kind of stuck with what's out there? Yeah, I mean, I think it is too small a market, but it's not just, uh, I don't think you see anybody new jumping into it because number one is you have supply chain issues and supply chain is going to solve what it needs to for the narrow bodies and, and wide bodies. They're not going to look at something new. And that's why I think De Havilland has an issue trying to restart the Q400. Is you're really going to get, I mean, are you going to have an order book big enough to attract people to get the supply chain going again? That's going to be a big, big challenge. Um, and, uh, but I, the, let's face it, the, the basis of any new airplane has to be an engine and I don't see any, you know, any new engine technology out there, uh, that is going to, that is going to make a new regional aircraft that much better than what exists today. And that, that exists not just in regional, right? So it's interesting you talk about the engine technology, because I think that's, that's really holding back all commercial aircraft development right yep. now. Not all, not not just in that engine technology is not progressing. It's that it feels like it's kind of on the cusp of changing. So who's going to make a 20, 30 year bet on something that could change in the next five to 10. And it's kind of, yep. you know, the NMA probably was a, was a, a mm -hmm. victim of this um, to some extent. Um, but how do you, it, it feels like the industry is about to change in a big way. And I'm thinking in terms of propulsion. So would you go out, you know, Rolls has the, um, well, even Rolls. So look at the, ultra um, fan? or what are they calling it? The ultra super, fan. Yeah. Yeah. ultra fan. Thank you. Super duper, super duper. <laughs> fan. Um, right. Super duper. But fan. even in, yeah, even in their super duper fan, it, they went the largest they could possibly go. Right, they started at the very tip top of that market. There are, I'm sure, there are engineering reasons for that, but that's also the least mm -hmm. likely to be replaced in the near term. So there's some safety, some market safety to going going to the top end. But if you're on the small side, I mean, what do you what are you going to commit to with a with a multi billion dollar 
new engine program or new aircraft program when it yeah. feels like we're right on on the cusp. And, and look, I mean, the things that Magniex and and you know on the electric motor side uh, is impressive. But again, it's not motors. Motors aren't the problem. It's the power source. Yes. Um, and and again, there's just a lot of a lot of movement that's creating this wait and see. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I I think you're right. The the, the electric motors uh, are just amaze me. I mean, I uh, you see how much the size of them is dropping. I mean, even uh, I looked at the I was out for the Archer uh, launch of the Midnight because uh, uh, a friend of mine's now working with them, and uh, so he invited asked me to come out to, to have a look, and their the technology they have on the motors and the gearbox and the uh, the inverters is unbelievable. Like it's, I was not expecting to see that. And the stuff that I've seen, I, uh, I had a look at the, uh, uh, Harbor air, the, uh, beaver that they've got with the power, with the electric motor in it. I mean, since they started, the electric motor has gone up in power and dropped in size by half. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And the weight, like the battery weight, you know, it used to fill the whole back of the airplane. Now it's much smaller. Mm. So I mean, there, those the yeah, is ramping up dramatically. So I don't know when you pull the trigger and say, okay, that's good enough. Let's move with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the electric motors just continue to amaze me how how efficient and how I think how reliable they are. Yeah. Yeah. A few right. Moving parts. And and I think probably also much yeah much more easily replaceable. I think right than a than a combustion engine where where you've got to oh, you know look at yeah. okay well if we're putting a ton of money in these things so it's kind of like we have to repair them and keep them flying versus you know just a, a motor in general you probably just look at it and go okay well yeah we're just going to put a new one in um, and it's going to keep going so but uh, yeah it's it's which you know makes me wonder does that you know or I, I think to me I've always thought that the next step is is more of the hybrid. Where you you take the advancements in the the electric mm -hmm. motors and everything else and tie that to you know where you you all of a sudden break up the different phases of, of flight right to be able to kind of use uh, you know use the, the the electric power which you know provides you the thrust that you need for you know the, the takeoff and and then you leave the combustion engine which is more efficient in, in cruise uh, you leave that alone and, and you kind of work work that in until you get to the point where yeah, you can you can do it, you know, all electric or. But to me, that's that should be the next step. I don't know if we're gonna see that. I think I know people are definitely pushing for that, uh, in some cases. But uh, yeah, 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 we'll see what where that goes. But it's definitely interesting yeah. to watch. I'm really interested. I'm really interested in um, the advancement, and I haven't seen much, by the way. But the advancement of APUs, I think there's a lot to be done there. Um, and the reason I'm thinking of that is because for a hybrid aircraft, um, if you think of the power source, which we already, well, if you think of the power, um, device or the, the motor itself, we have great electric motors already. Like you said, I mean, they're, they're fantastic. They're reliable. They're, they're delivering power. What we're lacking is the, the battery technology the fuel source, as yeah. we think of it as the fuel as source or the battery. Yeah. But we have an amazing battery already. We have a stable, you know, temperature stable battery. It's called Jet A, and the problem with Jet A is it just destroys the planet. Um, you know, just just a, a, a small problem. It's efficient but up until why a point. the the problem, uh, it, you know, in a in a power source is you know you can drive electric motors with Jet A. The intermediary is the APU. It's just that the APU is not as efficient at converting uh, fuel to electricity as just, you know, burning it through, uh, through say, a turbine engine or whatever. But that's because they're not really built to do that. So, I mean, there's there are different paths down which this new technology can can take us, one of, one of which is, you know, producing a super efficient APU that just converts fuel to electricity, from which then if you don't have to, to throw that exhaust out the back of the airplane, you can catch it. Right, you can then work on carbon mm -hmm. capture. I don't mean out of the atmosphere. I mean out of your own yeah. exhaust, which exists today. Um, yes, to, to varying degrees. Yeah. So it's just a lot of different different ways that I know that that these things are being uh, are being considered today. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. There's there's so many. 
so many different avenues that you can follow um, to to make things happen. Like we said, I think we all agree that the electric motors are getting to the stage where they can do it. It's how do you how do you keep them running? So, and that's why I kind of I kind of like the universal hydrogen with the conversion. Uh, to the electric motor and the fact you can expand it just by putting them in line. <laughs> you know, you can make more power. Um, you know, there's... Uh, so, it would be nice to see that happen. There's got a lot of things that they've got to do uh, to do that. But I'm still, uh, of the battery technology, I still think it it's too heavy. As much as they've made mm -hmm. huge advances in dropping the weight, it's too heavy and it has to be replaced too often. Yeah. Like the efficient, it, it, you it, have, it doesn't hold efficiency longer term. You have a list of factors. There's like 10 and yeah. throughput, yeah. Uh, ability to handle heat, ability to handle different temperatures in, in flight, yeah. you know, um, energy density, which is what we always think about, uh, but then volumetric density, you know, you have this list of 10 things right but you that you need all of them and you can only really pick five with with current yeah. battery technology and you're absolutely right i mean batteries have become way lighter over over the years um i think the challenge is that that is we are quickly reaching the limits with lithium and lithium ion lithium based batteries and what we can get out of the density there's still value yeah. to be had, but that growth, I'd see this often where people would say, yeah, but look at this line. And if we just take that line and we draw it out so many years, I said, well, if that were true, we would have sold about 50,000 CRJ 200s. So. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I, I just, it, you know, the, it's going to be a very, very interesting next few years. Um, next 10 years uh, till something sort of major happens I think um, and it, it's hard to say what is going to be the uh, you know what do you bet on right now it's impossible to say yeah it is definitely a challenge Rod can you uh, take us take us through the work that you're doing now as a part of um, is it Sheridan Enterprises the Sheridan conglomerate I forget something the... like that yeah <laughs> Yeah. I can't, had to come up with a name right? very quickly. Yeah, about <laughs> 10 years ago, I had to come up with a name very quickly. So I just shared in aviation. And then and I put, oh, well, maybe I'll throw services in there too. So, yeah, I, I'm since uh, uh, stepping away from uh, NAC after the restructuring. Um, I, uh, I, I've been working with a couple different companies. Uh, and uh, the one that I'm working with right now, uh, which is a very interesting project is uh, the guys at Air Nostrum, who they actually create, they now own the second largest uh, aerial firefighting company in Europe. And uh, I think given probably next year, will be the largest aerial firefighting company in Europe. Uh, they also have operations in North Africa and in uh, Latin America. And so one of the things that I did was because in going back into sort of cool things that happened at Bombardier is that uh, we took the Q400 in 2002 uh, and uh, we turned it into a firefighter with Ruth Conair out in Abbotsford, BC, mm -hmm. the fighter. So we just uh, now Conair and, uh, uh, and Air Nostrum are kind of working together uh, to expand uh, Q400 or Dash 8400 operations uh, in Europe. Uh, using uh, the uh, uh, what's called Plisa, is the uh, Air Nostrum company. They operate about uh, 19 uh, thrush firefighters right now, uh, and then hopefully uh, with Conair, uh, do a few there, and then a few down in Latin America as well. So I think it's an interesting business, and you know, it was it was uh, kind of funny is uh, Barry Marsden is one of the founders of uh, Conair, who was. Uh, I'd known for many, many years, and uh, he and I were on a fishing trip back in like early mid '90s, and he was talking about the Q400 being a future firefighter. And Barry had a lot of vision. Did he created? He took um, uh, Grumman trackers and put turbine engines on them yeah. uh, for firefighting. He did uh, some really cool things, 
and he just said, no, I think the Q400 is going to be a good firefighter. And we talked and talked, we talked for years. And then uh, he said, okay, I got to do something with the French. And I said, well, we're just taking back these ones from SAS. Would that might work? And then I had to convince John Holding, who uh, was the head of engineering at Bombardier, uh, to let us access the, uh, the data on the Q400 to see if we could turn it into a firefighter. And we did. And uh, we started and out those... with two for the French, and now there's going to be, I think, uh, next summer there could be up to 30 wow. flying. Yeah. The, the water on that firefighter is outside of the fuselage, correct? Yeah. It's, it was a tank. It was originally put on because the, the French wanted something they could use in the, because firefighters fly 350, 400 hours a year. So they wanted something where you could drop the tank off and use it as a passenger or a cargo airplane. And so the tank was, uh, it was convertible. Yeah, well, it took you four hours to put it on. It took you about an hour to take it off. And that's the, the, the first two French airplanes have that. I don't think the next six ones, which were with brand new airplanes, I don't think it, I think it's just their straight firefighters. And then Con Air, they just, there was an announcement. They just uh, bought uh, seven more airplanes, um, which were uh, ex-NAC. Uh, they bought them through uh, Ergo, I think. Uh, they, uh, you know, those will be direct firefighters. And Con Air is the biggest and most capable firefighting company in the world. It's absolutely no question. They're amazing. You know, Barry built an yeah. amazing, amazing I mean, company. It, you know, Barry, unfortunately, passed away a couple it's of years un, It's unfortunate that it's a growing market, but it does create opportunities, right? Because obviously the, the the reason why we need them is, is more of them is because of the, the you know, Issues that we're having around the world, where there's more more wildfires everywhere, but uh, but it is a, a an opportunistic uh, area, I think, for some that that you know definitely look at that. So it's it's interesting that they're using Q400s for that. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's definitely a need. need. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a need, and you know what? It's got it's that engine. That engine's got so yeah. much power that you know it can get in, drop stuff, and then I flew the simulator, and like when you drop the uh, the retardant. And then push the power up. I mean, you pitch up twenty degrees plus, and it's climbing like a homesick angel. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, which yeah, seeing some of those videos. I remember the of, um, of, you know the firefighters that are out there that are that are doing that job. It's like wow, that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's some maneuvering right there. So, but the in, most interesting thing, and it's because of what we did and what John Holding let us do um, many many years ago is um, that airplane actually has an STC that's approved in the U.S., Canada, and in France. Uh, and it's got a, it, which, you know, most of the other sort of sort of ad hoc firefighters, they're like one of STCs. They're not uh, not fully mm. accepted. So, it's, which is interesting. You know, you, you, you see like, you know, Tanker 10 converts, they've got four DZ-10s converted. Yeah, those are all sort of one-offs. It's not like they created something and because they don't have to go through the full, you know, there's only going to be X number of them. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, Conair did the right thing and they've, it's gone through the proper, uh, the proper channels. Did an amazing, amazing job. So what you already mentioned the, the engine power, what else, what factors make an aircraft a good firefighting aircraft? Oh, you're asking the wrong person. Because if you talk to the the guys that I deal with at Con Air and at Plyce, at Nair Nostrum and that, they just say that it has to be, it's not one airplane, it's a balanced fleet. And that you want it, you need helicopters and you need small uh, water wow. bombers, you need big water bombers. I mean, something that it drops retardant, what they do is tend to frame the fire with the retardant. Because the retardant lasts. If you drop water on it, it's almost gone instantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, it cools things down, but you have to drop lots of it to make it work. But if you put, they fence it with retardant, if there's a fire, they'll put four sides down and then they'll let the helicopters and the smaller and the water bombers come in and hit it in the center. But you got to stop it from spreading. You know, the traditional way of stopping it from spreading is bulldozers. You create, create a huge area where there's no fuel, you know, where this is a way of just, you know, slowing the fuel down. And you keep dropping it on it, and then it can't can't spread, because that's the big thing. So uh, you do need, and uh, so uh, Jeff at Conair would be proud to hear this, but you do need a balanced fleet, and you can't do it with one. 
you got to be able to you need water you know if they're if you're near water and you can keep dumping water on it that's great but if you're not near water or you're in areas where the water bomber isn't as you know aerodynamically as, as efficient as a q400 q400 can get into places where the water bomber might have challenge mm -hmm. so and then but then you have the smaller airplanes like the uh the fire cats on floats that they can go down scoop water and drop they can do you know lots of different things. so you need the bat there is no one it's a balanced fleet you know so ultimately the, the q400 just i mean I'm, I'm i don't know anything about firefighting airplanes but um the q400 basically you you fill it up you take off you do your thing you come back you land you fill it back up and then you go back up is that the okay the way right. you go yeah yeah versus yep. so and it's what's in, what's interesting is and you fill it up with retardant so, uh, but the interesting, because of the way the Q400 is built and the speed of it, it gets to and from the, the mm -hmm. fires pretty quickly. And it's oh, got good, it's got good field performance. It's got very good field performance. Yeah. So it is, it, it, it does have that. It's got tons of power. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's built to, again, to have them design things, uh, like overbuilt. And that is, uh, that's why it's going to be a, a good airplane in the future. There's no question. We like to say rugged, but over rugged. that's fine too. Rugged. Okay. <laughs> rugged. Sorry. So Rod, you've been in the industry doing this for, let me check my notes. Yeah. Forever. Um, what looking back, like what, what, what's, what stands out the most? What, what, you know, is your kind of key memory, most, proud kind of moment in the industry what what sticks with you the most well that's a tough one there are a, there's so many different you know programs that we got to do i mean we created you know we because we bought 100 you know b120s we created uh, freighters and talking to jim mclean who created it for us um he told me he says yeah i says i'm just on the 35th when we did it we thought we might do 10 and now he's He's just creating the 35th one. Um, so uh, th there are so many different things that I think were interesting. Uh, from my perspective to do, what was the most impact uh, in the industry is a, is a really, is a tough question. I mean, I think the time at Bombardier, I think, I think the, and I'm going to steal from a video that Courtney did. I think the one thing that changed uh Airbus and Boeing was the creation of the 220, the, sorry, the CR, the uh, C series. Um, it used to be when I was with Bombard, when I was with uh, NAC, if I said C series, I had to put 20 euros in a jar. So, um, <laughs> um, I, uh, but I think it and the thought behind it, and quite frankly, the CRJ 200. You know, and the CRJs after that made a huge impact and it changed the industry for a brief period of time. And it's important because it is a brief period and things evolved and that, but uh, it made big changes. Um, do I think I know what the next change is going to be? You know, it's going to be around fuels and propulsion, but, you know, it's hard to say where. I mean, I, I think some of the cool things that were done on the, uh, on the C-Series were... You know the way it was built, and you know the uh, uh, the control uh, the control logic that went into it. Uh, there were, you know, the, just the, the way the uh, the wings were built. That whole process was amazing. You know, the fact that on the uh, on the flight controls it was a uh, on the logic and the flight controls it was a combination of Boeing and Airbus. You know, there were all these things that people mm -hmm. forget that went into that. That really, that I think Airbus saw and Boeing didn't see. All right, Garrett, and, put Rob Dewar on the list, which he already is, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you have to. You got to get Rob. <laughs> Rob is, yeah, you have to get Rob on, yeah. no question. Because, I mean, these things that were done were just so amazing. Yeah. What, what was, uh, you know, it was funny taking people through the factories and that thing back then was that, because they say, what do you mean? That nobody rip this was all riveted, like the cockpit was all riveted uh, robotically? What are you talking about? And then you'd have guys running down, checking each individual cockpit that was there to make sure they, the, uh, 
the rivets were in the same place that they weren't moved around and that sort of thing that there weren't errors you know there were it, it was the whole way production was done there was uh, you know so i think bombardier did uh, added some some of the things that bombardier created will impact the industry uh, it had a huge impact on the industry that aren't recognized yeah you know, yeah they're still existing on uh, what they're doing with the uh, the global expresses and that sort of thing but the, what was done on the C series i think was was pretty amazing there i think after that my favorite the o airbus 100 yeah one of my favorite uh, CRJ or C series production stories um what is the uh the the wooden mock up that they had yeah. in in the factory and the whole idea was they built the airplane in wood not for the actual aircraft but for the the production of it to have yeah. people actually practice and and physically do the jobs that they needed to do to see if it could be manufactured what challenges they were going to have and we were walking through and I can't remember who uh, it wasn't a, they didn't end up taking the aircraft. It was a very influential, uh, low cost carrier. And we had been briefed, look, don't show them the wooden stuff. It looks hokey. You don't want them. Uh, we don't want to showcase <laughs> that we're actually building a wooden version of this. And as we're walking through the factory, of course, they noticed it and they said, what's that? And so we explained it to them and they said, this is the greatest thing that you have going on right now. This is why we really like what you're doing is because that this is the problem that Boeing got into on the 787. These are the problems that, you know, this is not sexy. This is you actually thinking about the problems. You should talk about this more often. <laughs> we go, kind of Oh, Oh yeah. It was a plan. Yeah. See, yeah, yeah, look exactly. here. <laughs> we just wanted to see if you'd notice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right. This has been uh, really fun. Uh, I mean, you know, your your experience in the industry and your your name in the industry is well known. So we we appreciate, you know, you taking the time to talk to us. I mean, you know, I know Courtney talks about you all the time, m mostly in a good light. Um, but uh, no, I mean, it's it's all it's all good. So that's better, better than, than that. average, I mean, you know. Yeah. Better than okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. I've, I've been on the I've been on the other end of Courtney's uh, criticism. So, so, but th this has been great. Uh, we we do appreciate it, um, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get a chance to talk to you again at another point and see what's going on in your life at that point. So, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time, guys. It was great. I enjoyed it. <laughs>